Although Chef Jose Andres needs no introduction locally or nationally, we want to thank this twice named times 100 most influential person, James Beard Outstanding Chef and Humanitarian of the Year, best-selling author, educator, humanitarian, and chef owner of the Think Food Group, so much for being with us today. As the founder of the nonprofit World Kitchen, World Central Kitchen, he um, inspired my own experience in campus kitchens, and we're so grateful to him for making time for us today. And without further ado, let us begin our program. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rivka. Um, I'm already a big fan of University of Shady Grove, and to hear your story and the impact that uh, this education has made on you is, is really continuing to impress me. I want to, like you, thank uh, Chef Susan Callahan of the hospitality program. She's been a longstanding partner of Mana Food Center. Most recently, she went to our uh, commercial kitchen that we share with uh, Silver Spring United Methodist, and she helped us feed more people by wasting less food and turning it into tasty meals for some of our partners at um, homeless shelters throughout the county. I also want to give a shout out to um, the Director of Administration here at USG, Jessica Nardi, who is um, a proud and uh, essential member of the Board of Directors of Mana Food Center. And I'm also extremely honored that the, center, the director of the Center for Student Engagement, um, Andrea Milo, included me and Mana Food Center in today's events. Uh, of course, it's a bit intimidating to be the warm-up act uh, for such a famous chef and a hero. Um, I mean, we have some things in common, you know. I love to eat. <laughs> I've been to his restaurants. Um, I am committed to ending hunger by offering good food and welcoming spaces, but I am no cook. Uh, in fact, my idea of a sous chef is to ask my spouse to put a burrito in the microwave. <laughs> but I am consoled by the fact that we do have a couple of things in common. We both lead uh, not-for-profit organizations, as you heard, focused on not only feeding hungry people, but also reforming the food systems that create the conditions of food insecurity in the first place. Uh, we've both been privileged to travel around the world to be of service to communities suffering from natural and human-made disasters and to respond to emergencies here at home. We both know how essential volunteers are to responding to crises and to offering hope and hospitality to their neighbors. At Mana Food Center, in fact, you add up, if you add up all of the hours volunteers give, um, in one year it equals 35 staff members. And so that basically doubles the capacity of Mana Food Center. And last year we were able to reach 34,210 neighbors um, with food and education. Today, I've been asked, and don't worry, it's only eight minutes, I've been asked to help uh, USG students and you guests contextualize the information and inspiration we're about to hear. This is a university, we do need to learn something and think about it in an analytical way. And so what I'd like to suggest is that as you listen, ask yourself some questions as you hear the stories and the statistics. Here in Montgomery County, for example, uh, an estimated 63,000 neighbors don't always know where their next meal is coming from. In fact, 50,000 students in our public school system receive meals at school because their parents and grandparents can't afford to keep enough food on the table. On the other end of the spectrum, more and more seniors are aging into poverty. People like a woman named Bella, who called me recently to thank me for the services she was receiving at our pantry at, with Colesville Presbyterian Church, and she said that everybody was so kind and welcoming to her, and she took the time to reach out and thank me. And of course, I really need to thank our staff and volunteers. There are the working poor. 30% of the people that turn to MANA have jobs, and they're struggling to make ends meet. So I'd like you to ask yourself, in this reality, do I need to reach out for some help? Now, before you shrink back with the idea of receiving charity, let me share that I understand a little bit about how hard it is to make ends meet. When I was an undergrad, I was helped by Pell Grants and student loans and personal loans from family members and a single mom who worked two jobs. And I also worked part-time. I know a lot of USG students juggle class and lab and homework and their jobs. That's why USG is in partnership with Capillaria Food Bank and uh, Chef Andres and I and others were able to visit a mobile market that's available once a month on the fourth Monday. And it was a joyous experience. Also, there's growler, uh, no, Grover's Essentials. Growler's Essentials would not be a good thing. 
Grover's Essentials, which is a daily pantry uh, that AmeriCorps member here at USG makes available. Um, on November 6, Mana's mobile kitchen called Manny is going to come and try to visit the campus to share some skills about how to cook simple, tasty, but budget conscious, healthy food. So take it from me, and I suspect the chef will agree, there is no shame in accepting help. In fact, receiving support boosts your chance for a brighter future, because when you are well fed, you have the energy to learn and succeed and then to contribute. So students and community members, if you need help, there are a range of organizations across the county that are here to serve you. The Montgomery County Food Council has an online directory and interactive map that lists the locations, the hours of operations, and more. We're, what we're all doing, more than 100 different organizations, is try to help reduce barriers to access food, nutrition, education, and more. Another question as you listen is, what part of the chef's story would you like to replicate? Is it volunteering your time when, when uh, the regular systems don't seem to be working? Is it uh, responding to a, a disaster? Or is it being a steady voice, um, as we just heard in the kitchen, for the, the, the values of America? Starting a social enterprise, we know that he's done that. Montgomery County is an excellent place to offer your time and your talent and work to innovate. Our volunteer center is a great clearinghouse for all different kinds of ways that you can pay it forward or give it back. And it's not just with food. You can give comfort to cancer patients. You can confront climate change. You can organize against gun violence. Basically, if you have a passion, there are literally are hundreds of local organizations uh, and uh, nonprofits that welcome your time and your talent. And if you are into food, organizations like MANA and our pop partners have opportunities to stock shelves at our warehouse on, right off of Shady Grove Road, share food at one of our 18 distribution sites, assist with our cooking classes, answer our phones, especially if you're bi or trilingual, hold food drives for culturally appropriate nutritious food, or use our mobile app to rescue food and help us um, as a food runner. You can also be like Chef Susan and come and prepare meals in our commercial kitchen. So finally, I wanna ask that you consider how can you bring your values into your current or your future workplace, because most of you are students. So maybe you don't wanna be a chef, or maybe you don't wanna be a nonprofit executive. But whatever you do, your career can still make an impact. Whether you're studying business, cybersecurity, public health, or biotech, you'll be working in organizations. And maybe those organizations need people who bring not only their talents and skills to work every day, but also their values and their commitments. Seek out and find institutions already committed to corporate social responsibility. Some, a group like Marriott International is a great shining example. Or if you somehow land in a place that doesn't have a corporate volunteer program or is behind the curve on sustainability, step up and show them how it's done. Today you'll get lots of ideas of making things happen in whatever sphere you operate in and in whatever stage of life you're in. So I offer you these questions because I know we're all excited to learn from uh, number 19 of the CAPS. Uh, I believe that was the jersey he wore last night. And so uh, without further ado, let's welcome Chef Jose Andres. All right, hi everybody. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. Thank you, Susan, sorry I couldn't come before, but uh, I know you've been trying to bring me for a long time, but believe me, I've been, I've been doing things. <laughs> and actually, I, I, I always put things on the scale, right? Of knowing that you were here, we knew that we had one of the best people and best leaders to try to move a program like the one you've been moving forward here. So thank you very much for everything you've done and inspiring so many young people in the last few years. And, and there's so many things we can be talking about. Uh, uh, actually, I'm expert in none. I'm only trying used to be one more soldier in every one of the issues that I believe are important to us, to America, our communities, specifically in what I know a little bit, which is food. Food is an amazing tool because very much, if you think about it, eating is the only thing we do from the moment we're born to the moment we go to a better life. We eat. From the first milk and food we receive in the first moment we began crying 
all the way to our last minutes, willing to go to this better world, whatever it is. Uh, we eat. And Briat Savaran, the French philosopher, said, tell me, tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. So if you really take this phrase to heart, it's like, yes, uh, food says a lot about who we are. Food says who we are in terms of where we come from, our ethnicity. Food says in what family traditions we grew up. We all have family traditions. Thanksgiving has been a new family tradition for me. Even if the country I come from, we never celebrate Thanksgiving, at least that day or the meaning of that day. But we celebrate something, other things, that at the end almost equal the same. Love for family, love for each other, love for traditions, love for history. And at the end of the day, that's what every plate of food does when we eat. Um, we can be telling so many stories about a plate of food. Yes, we can be telling the story about the farmers that work hard and sometimes super underpaid. And that the chef gets the credit for the great plate, but the farmers are even never mentioned. And they're the ones working hard to make sure we have those amazing products every season. Um, with a plate of food, we can be telling the story of many immigrants that they are undocumented and that we are underpaying them and sometimes mistreating them. Yes, we pay them, but it's almost like a new form of slavery. Like we pay them to say, shut up and don't bother, so we can keep putting food in our tables. Today in Congress, we are serving food to our senators and congressmen that is being picked by those undocumented that are voiceless, and that we rather prefer Republicans and Democrats keep them in the shadows versus bringing them into the real American dream. A plate of food can tell you that story. A plate of food can tell you a story of restaurants that maybe we work and maybe we are underpaying our people because sometimes it's not like the restaurant wants to underpay anybody. But it's almost like the restaurant doesn't make it if you don't keep everybody on the minimum wage. And sometimes you we finger point at people that do that like they are bad people, but actually the same owners of the little restaurant in our community, they're having a hard time making it every week to pay the bills. At the end of the plate of food can be telling you the story that we all want our communities to do better, but most of us sometimes we don't buy from our local community shops. Because sometimes they are too expensive because the economics of a little shop in the middle of the town center is too expensive for what we can afford. So we decide to buy online because it's cheaper. But in the process of buying something online that's cheaper, and we say we're making our communities poorer. Nobody's doing it on purpose. We all want to do well for ourselves. But sometimes in the process of trying to survive, we make our own communities poorer. We'll buy shoes in an in a online shop, and the shoes come from far away. As the shoe store down the road from where we live is shutting down because no buyer. Nobody's buying from him anymore. So we are all part of the problem. But at the same time, I do believe we are all part of the solution. And food has many of these opportunities. Um, Robert Egger, who is very much the mentor of many, I know he's my mentor, I know he's my hero, I know Susan Callahan, worked closely with him and make Robert Egger dream become true, was this amazing food fighter, a bartender, that saw that waste was wrong. And there was too much food going on around that never got to anybody and ended in the garbage cans every single kitchen in America. And he created this uh, place 35 years ago, DC Central Kitchen, right after uh, George Bush inauguration day. And he thought that food waste was wrong, especially wrong when you have people that have nothing. And he thought that also many people didn't have the same opportunity that maybe I got as an immigrant to find a place to belong, a place to call home, a place to work and be part of the community. So he began getting this idea that food waste was wrong, but at the same time, we were wasting people's lives, homeless in the street, that some people may even <laughs> dare to say that they are homeless because they want to. When every one of those homeless people, they have names and last names, and they have stories. 
And sometimes the story is that they got the wrong lottery ticket. And he began bringing those people out of the streets and giving them an opportunity. All of a sudden, he was not wasting food no more, and he was not wasting lives no more. And he began giving them a place to all come together. He began feeding the homeless in many shelters around the city, and in the same time, training those ex-homeless and ex-convicts that they were learning how to become cooks, and then graduating, and then becoming part of the American dream by finding jobs in the community. Um, that's where I began learning the value of a plate of food to change the lives of many. Uh, Robert Egger said something like, I hope you are going to write in your forehead. He said that charity seems is always about the redemption of the giver, when charity should be about the liberation of the receiver. Way too often when we do something, we feel good about what we do it, without sometimes asking ourselves if what we're doing has any real effect any real return on investment on the people we are trying to help. We need to start asking ourselves if we are used redeeming ourselves, or if really, sincerely, we are trying to help others. It's nothing wrong to be nice and give things away, but we need to, and we must do better in the 21st century. Every time we do it, we need to be thinking, are we liberating those people we are actually trying to help? And that's what I believe what you guys are doing here is part of that solution. And, but we need to do better. We cannot wait for the government just to solve every issue. We cannot just wait for the um, business community just to solve every issue. And also we cannot just wait for every single NGO or university with good programs to solve the issue. But actually, we need all of them working as one to solve those problems. Because we shouldn't be having anybody working in two jobs having to go to a pantry or a, a, a soup kitchen to know what they're going to be feeding their families. This is wrong. We cannot have the richest country in the history of America have a system that even people working still they cannot make it at the end of the month. And we need to start asking ourselves who are going to be those leaders that they're going to be showing us a way. They confuse us with these talks about capitalism and socialism and communism. Listen, nothing is perfect. Me, I love to live in a capitalist community. But in a capitalist community that doesn't get me things at the expense of others getting nothing. It has to be a more equalitarian, pragmatic capitalism where we all do well, or at least we all have the opportunity to do well. And that's what food is at the beginning of many of the problems we face. Food is the solution to many of those problems. So, I'm not going to keep going because I don't know how much they didn't even give me time. <laughs> uh, and I don't know, but I want to show you one part of, of the work I've done, uh, of the learnings of many. My, my first job uh, was at Haleo in Washington, 7th and 1993. And for me, it was almost a blessing that they had. That was my f second time I came to America. First time I was in the Spanish Navy. Um, First time I saw hunger, probably. Abidjan, Ivory Coast, and the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Where I came from, you know, my father and my mother, at the end of the month, usually was very empty, our refrigerator. But my mother always knew what to do with the leftover chicken and the leftover uh, two eggs left, and she'll make croquetas and shit. <laughs> I was very happy that they didn't have a lot of money because those croquetas were damn awesome. Like when she gave me fish at the beginning of the month, I went, I don't want fish, I want croquetas. <laughs> uh, creativity helps sometimes in these moments. And, and that's not creativity, but knowledge about how to feed a family almost with nothing. My mom was that type of woman. She was a nurse. My father was a nurse. I always uh, went to hospitals because I saw them. Uh, my father would work in the night shift, my mother in the morning shift. So the hospital was the place of changing kids. Uh, they would drop us at night or in the morning. And, and so I saw hospitals as a beautiful place where nurses and doctors will go the extra mile always beyond their duties. For me, it was a surprise uh, when I moved to D.C. that um, great. When, um, um, stop it. When um, 
the restaurant was across this building, probably none of you has visited. And it's a building, red brick building, and it says the missing soldier's office, right on 7th and E. The missing soldier's office was this place that this amazing woman, that is very much an example that uh, in my profession, woman fit the wall. We always talk about male chefs like me that were so cool. Well, let me tell you the truth. This planet is fed by women. The seven billion people we are in this planet, it wasn't for women, wouldn't be eating. Um, but then if we go to other parts, it's so many women that they've done so much. Um, this journalist has been following me all day, and now he did this connect, and I'm about to tell him, just leave me alone. <laughs> it's all the journalists from Spain of the sports diaries. We have like seven sports diaries. They want to talk to me about what I did yesterday at the baseball stadium. <laughs> Why are sports journalists calling me? I'm sorry. They are paying the bad. They, they are closing for two nights, and oh my God, sorry. <laughs> but let's go back. Um, so that business all this office is where Clara Barton had her main office. And Clara Barton, as you know, she was taking care of an entire network to take care of the wounded during the Civil War. Wounded of both sides. And to me, it was amazing that this woman, almost with nothing, only with an idea, was able to create such a powerful network. Me, I thought, if my, like my mom and my dad that took care of people, look at that woman, what she was able to create. Thanks to her, the Red Cross was created. My father loved to cook, and he's the one that really got me cooking. So I thought, man, if a woman like this was able to create this amazing organization to take care of the, of the wounded, why cooks like me, we cannot be really also in moments, in emergencies, trying to take care of the hungry. And that's why World Central Kitchen was created. And all right, how this works. What is this? So World Central Kitchen was created in, after the earthquake in Haiti. Um, when that happens, I, I landed. Um, I went there a few weeks after, but the city was very much like this. And I began cooking in some of the, of the shelters. Are you going to do it or do I do it? You do it, because it doesn't seem, I don't know how it works. The instructions are in English. <laughs> and, and I began going. Uh, and that's what we began doing, uh, how food can be an agent of change. And we began doing programs in Haiti. Why Haiti? Because I thought, if we can make something happen in Haiti, we can make something happen anywhere. Um, so we began doing some programs. Um, this is a school in a place called Palmistampe, in the middle of nowhere. So it was a Spanish NGO that I was working with, with them after the earthquake. And I liked very much how they worked. So we began doing our own projects with them. They will, do, they will build the school to do education. We will build the kitchen and the dining room to provide meals. Thanks to that, we were able to increase 300% the kids enrollment in that school in the middle of nowhere. Was no houses in that community, but we will have 120 children. I never knew where it came from. And now I know where they come from. But it's amazing, these communities, how, how when you give them a place to succeed, for them is just what they want. People don't want our pity. People always want our respect. And this is a way to give them respect. We were not running the operation. They were running it with our help. Uh, we began bringing clean cooking. Today, three billion people, I'm not going to get into it right now, but that they still cook with fossil fuels. We have three billion people today that cook like humankind was cooking a quarter million years ago. For them, none of, we complain that sometimes we don't have enough. We go to our hotel and we don't have hot water, and we are like, you call, I'm like, why I don't have hot water? And you have people that sometimes don't even have the fuel to cook the food for their family. Forget about not having food. Imagine that on top of having difficulty bringing food to the table, you still have to work hard to bring wood or charcoal to the kitchen. That, that's not poverty, that's beyond that. So clean cooking is one of these ways, right? This is still with charcoal or fuel, 
but because these kitchens are uh, modern, um, what we call improve, they use less. Today we have children that don't go to school, usually young girls, because the girls are sent to the forest to pick up wood when the family is too poor to buy charcoal. That's a matter if you have a school in the community, will don't do any good because the girls usually will spend hours every day taking care of the wood and taking care of the water. It's no hope. A kitchen actually give them that hope. I'm not gonna get into that, but this is a fascinating issue that I spend whatever free time I have. I spend a lot of time in this around the world. Those are the kitchens we built. We did more than 100 kitchens in Port au Prince. With these kitchens that we help finance, look at the kitchens, they used to be black, now they are white. The cooks are so happy because now they don't have to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning every day. Now the cooks don't get born, these amazing women chefs with, the, with their legs that they are always full of barns because the charcoal. Now the women don't die because they have to inhale the smoke. Now their children don't have to go to the forest to pick up the wood to start cooking. All of a sudden, they are saving money because a person in Haiti can spend 25% of their daily salary in the charcoal to cook their meal. Can you imagine if you had to spend 25%? Starbucks looked cheap compared to that. <laughs> we began doing social business like Poisson Beni. This is in an orphanage, a restaurant we opened to achieve two things. A place where the employees could eat and create kind of a social business within the orphanage. A place where the children getting older had a profession to learn. This was uh, an orphanage that all the children are handicapped some way. So we built a kitchen that was good for handicapped people, uh, for handicapped young children. And that was Poisson Beni. And I'm so happy because we also got a restaurant in a community that had no restaurant. And this is what you achieve with these things, different layers of trying to help a little bit. Uh, creating jobs, training people, uh, creating an economy to help the orphanage to move, and also create uh, a feeling that you are a community. Uh, we open a kitchen because we believe, even if you are seeing the news in Haiti, that tourism is the only way forward. I did a documentary called Und uh, Undiscovered Haiti, which showed the beauty of Haiti to anybody. I did it with National Geographic and PBS, but this was part of the bigger scheme. Because the tourism industry would need people, we created a school very much in what we saw, what Susan Callahan is doing and what I learned at DC Central Kitchen. Now we are graduating over 80 people every year, mainly women, and we make sure that we negotiate the contracts with Marriott, which actually they've been a great partner, and I'm so happy that they are part of our community, and many other hotels that are, they've been opening around Haiti. Uh, now, you're not gonna believe it, but part of this team, uh, the, uh, her name is, uh, uh, um, uh, she's the main uh, director of the school. Uh, man, I'm forgetting her name. I, I'm forgetting her name. I'm like Dory, Nicole. <laughs> I, I'll forget in a second. But she is amazing because this is her house. And she kind of donated her house to the, the school, Dashboard Central Kitchen. And her legacy is going to be amazing. I didn't do it. She did it. She made it happen. Wall Central Kitchen only is there to support her. Now we send many of her people to help us in Bahamas because there were so many Haitians that we were cooking Haitian food in the middle of a hurricane response to the Haitians that they were in Bahamas. So beautiful story. That's what happened then with World Central Kitchen. We grow so quickly. Puerto Rico happened. We received these messages everywhere. SOS. We need water. We need food. And what we did? I told my wife, I'll come back. I'll be back in the weekend. We had people coming. And my wife only cares that I'm back home, only not because me and because she loves me, but because we cook in the night. <laughs> and she's a very practical woman, that's why I love her. Um, uh, uh, um, so I remember calling her uh, probably with tears in my eyes and saying, I'm not coming back uh, 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 on the weekend. That was Thursday, Friday night. And, and she answered me back, it's really bad, right? I would say, yeah. So what we saw is that was 3.7 million Americans that on top of that, they don't have the right to vote. That's another point. Very much like Washington, D.C. Um, we, we are still living in colonial times. Um, don't go so quick. That, um, um, that they didn't, we didn't have a response. We had entire cities without water. 
We had entire cities without food. We had entire communities without gas, without cell signal. And I'm not talking three days. I'm not talking one week. We're talking weeks and weeks after. We are having entire communities without knowing where the medicine was coming. And actually, many of the things were there. But by going to the big meetings on, of my beloved FEMA, um, I love the people of FEMA, but the organization has to change so much. Things were there in place, but if you don't deliver them, equals you don't have them. If they, hey, I have water. Yeah, you have the water, but you're not delivering, equals you have no water. What we did was what you see here. All these people were not in line waiting for a plate of food. All these people were, uh, well, maybe some of them, but there we had the pickup line at the end where entire communities will come to pick food for 2,000 people, 500 people, 200 people, 1,000 people, hospitals, community centers, elderly homes. In less than two weeks, we reached the 78 communities. In, we went from one kitchen to 26 kitchens. We went from 1,000 meals a day to 150,000 meals a day. We almost made over 4 million meals between what we did and other partners and ideas. What was impossible was possible. And the only difference compared to anybody else, everybody said, Jose, you were so amazing. You did something so crazy. Were you able to get the food? I'm like, come on, man. I mean, we don't, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't know how to multiply bread. I say, and what did you do? Like, and what did you do? We went to the store. <laughs> we went to the biggest store. That's the private sector thinking. Uh, everybody was trying to bring food from Florida, and Puerto Rico was full of food. The only thing you had to go is to where the food was. That's it. So that's how brilliant we were, quite frankly. <laughs> and this is the map. We didn't only had there our kitchens, but we had what anybody else was doing. So we are not becoming, we are the small NGO. We never show up anywhere. When you see what anybody is doing, you never see the name of Old Central Kitchen. But lately, more and more, we are the ones there and making it happen. So we go and we don't take care of who we are, we took care of everybody. When we, bakeries were closed because they didn't have generators. You know what we did? The big NGOs were trying to bring the bread from Florida. The little NGO, you know what we did? We took three generators, we gave them to the bakeries, the bakeries were running next day. You see the difference? Big uh, NGOs were trying to bring water from all around the world. We needed water. We went with uh, technicians, we tried to fix some of the big water reservoirs and bring units on the side, and just we got the water. So when everybody was trying used to bring the aid from outside, we were only using the locals to fix the local problems with local people. We were faster and quicker. We were also cheaper, by far, and we made it happen. Look at the lines of sandwich makers. You talk about the community, how to help, we didn't do it, they did it. Puerto Rico fed themselves 25,000 volunteers. Imagine how operation. We didn't have one name before we began. We ended with 25%. When the hurricane came last month, Dorian, we had the entire community ready. We had all the kitchens ready. We were ready like if there was going to be the last day of humanity. At the end, nothing happened. We celebrated because we were ready. And then everybody went home. But we knew we could do it if that happened again. And this, this young girl here, this is amazing. She will never eat her plate until her entire community, every elderly person that couldn't come up to our food truck, will not receive the plate of food. She and her other friend will make sure that every elderly couple that couldn't leave their home will get the plate of food. Sometimes she'll be hungry. she tell me, quick, Jose, quick, because I'm hungry. <laughs> and I tell her, what you don't need now? She no, I need to feed everybody first. Like, OK. And that's what we do. Um, this was a trip with President Clinton and Hillary Clinton, who I love what they keep doing with their foundation. Uh, what they are really doing is meaningful. Sometimes you hear a strange thing, like, hey, I can only tell you one thing. In the places they are and the places I see the Clinton Foundation, I see what, that what they're doing is amazing. They bring the community together and they create this amazing support into whatever they do. So I'm very impressed with what they've been doing over the years. And this is what you see. This is beyond feeding people. This is beyond the six months uh, after the hurricane. 
over the last uh, year and a half, World Central Kitchen, we've been doing what I thought we had to do, help small farmers all across Puerto Rico. So when the farmers couldn't get loans from the bank, we began giving them grants. And with those grants, they were able to come back. Many of them were thinking about leaving Puerto Rico and coming here to the homeland. But when they saw that we were there to help them, we began partnering with them. Through those emergencies, you know what we did that nobody else does? We began buying from them anything they had. Because when the economy stops, everybody suffers. So you start bringing everything from the outside, the money doesn't stay locally. What we do is trying to start buying locally, so in the process of feeding people after a hurricane, we start the reconstruction of those same communities. In the long run, now we are in more than 60, 70 farms. We're about to get into 70 others, and we have all types of farms, from goats, uh, uh, cheese farms, to hydroponics, to uh, more traditional farming, to tree farming, mangoes, avocados. Uh, but then we are building in a smart way. Like the hydroponics is our inside containers. If another hurricane comes, nothing will happen because that container is right down to the rock. If the winds come, they shut down, they put together, the wind goes away, next morning they're in business again. This is the type of resilience we are building. Not only making sure that Puerto Rico stops importing every single food they consume, more than 90% of the food Puerto Rico consumes comes from the outside, but we are trying to make them more food uh, resilient, and at the same time, we're trying to get ready if the next hurricane comes, that next morning they can be back into business. That's the kind of thinking World Central Kitchen does. Now we respond to places like Guatemala. We were the first NGO on the floor. We took care of every single, every single uh, refugee uh, camp or shelter. We arrived there before any international agency arrived, or even the government. We took care of everybody in less than 24 hours. We took care, as you see the maps, those are all our kitchens, that's the volcano. And that's what we do, maps, and we start making sure that everybody is just taken care of. Doesn't have much more creativity than that. Uh, this is in many of the communities all around. And we don't go one day to take the photo. I wanna make sure that everybody understands that. Once we connect with a community, we don't leave them until we don't feel they are already back to normal, whatever normal is. This was North Carolina. Uh, some people are trying to make this. If, if we are uh, one party or another, we, we, we don't ask for people who they vote or who they support. People are people with the people. If you're hungry, we'll be there for you because I know one day you'll be there for us. <laughs> this was, again, North Carolina. Uh, when you talk about our great men and women, I cannot say anything wrong about the men and women of FEMA, the men and women of the Red Cross, the men and women of the military, because they are great. What we need to be changing is leadership above, meaning who, who, is, who is running it. The systems are too, too complicated right now. We make systems very simple, because there you see these men and women. If we will have to be asking for leadership to help us, I'll be waiting two months, and still I will not get the okay. But they are always ready to help, and we do this everywhere. Uh, in Bahamas, I was being helped by the DEA. I mean, the Drug Enforcement Administration, who was going to tell me that they were going to be delivering food? Um, this was uh, in Indonesia. Uh, after the uh, earthquake there and the two tsunamis, uh, we had an amazing team in Indonesia. Now we work with the Indonesian government. And they don't, they, they, are, they don't like NGOs a lot for uh, some reasons that I understand sometimes. But they saw what we were doing and they, they just became our best supporters. Um, we adapt every time. I love these uh, containers. I didn't go myself to Indonesia. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I have a business to do, family, all the things, no excusing myself, but it's when you North Carolina also happen and then you have to divide to conquer. But the team in Indonesia probably has been our best operation. And I'm so proud because knowing that I don't, I don't need to be there and the operation even runs better, that gives me a lot of pride that we created an organization that is here for the long run where everybody is taking ownership. Um, there you, 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 you have Ramiro and you have um, um, uh, Jesus. Man, I'm like Dory. Uh, <laughs> that gentleman over there with the bandana uh, he began helping us in Puerto Rico. And I didn't know that 
as he was helping us, very much they told him that his life was over because he had what they called terminal cancer. They, he, did, uh, he did some treatment, radiation, but uh, when he was supposed to be getting the results, just the hurricane blew everything away and he didn't know. When he had the opportunity a few months later after he was helping us, uh, guess what thing? That radiation worked and right now he's 100% cancer free. We bring lights uh, in Bahamas. We deliver more than 25,000 light, uh, lights in partnership with the Hispanic Federation of Lin Manuel Miranda and Luis uh, Manuel Miranda, my, my, new, uh, my amazing icons and great leaders. So we bring lights because once we had the systems of distribution, we began bringing medicines, we began bringing generators. This was Mozambique, uh, was cholera in Mozambique but our camps were run so well. We had a lot of experience with cholera in Haiti, and now we put that experience up and running. Uh, we did close to 400,000 meals in Mozambique working next to World Food Program. World Food Program will do the big feeding in the communities and will take care of the camps. I was so proud of that one. Uh, we will use the track so our people will not get in contact with their people. Not like they were sick, but only making sure that because we were feeding so many people, making sure there was no any option on cholera in any way. So by putting them inside the track and keep them away was a great way to be delivering food, making sure that the entire system was clean. But those camps were cholera free. So we only make sure that we were going to be cholera free all the way. And quite frankly, I was very proud because the camps we fed everybody, they were cholera free from day one to the last day of that camp. And then this is Bahamas. We landed there three days before Dorian hit. We had a team in Fort Lauderdale and a team in Nassau. And then from Nassau, we were going to land into Freeport, uh, into Marsh Harbor, and they start feeding Marsh Harbor first because the hurricane was coming that direction. And Marsh Harbor was going to be the first island we could help. Um, when we arrived to Marsh Harbor, we saw that the hotel we were going to use was totally destroyed, so we couldn't use it. So we went to Plan B, we used this helipad, in the middle almost of the sea to be the first place for us to be landing. And from there, we began feeding Marsh Harbor. And then with the same helicopter, we start feeding the case and the other parts all around Abaco. In the same time, uh, we had a boat in Fort Lauderdale arriving with half a million pounds of food to Freeport. So we had Nassau Kitchen feeding everybody in Abaco and Freeport Kitchen feeding everybody in Grand Bahama. Um, this was the boat with the helipad. In the process, we were able to rebuild this dock. They, we built it in 72 hours. You see, we're an NGO that we are about food. And my issue was, shit, how do I tell my, the board? Because now we have a board, and I love the board, but it's like, <laughs> how we tell the board that we are spending money of the NGO on a dog when we are a food? Well, without the dog, we couldn't bring food into the island. So there it is. We built the dog because thanks to the dog, we could bring food. So it's always food in the middle of uh, every explanation. That was the boat we were able to rent, actually almost given to us for free with the two helipads. Without this boat, we couldn't do it, but we were independent. We could be doing whatever. We brought more than two and a half million pounds of food into Freeport and Abaco. This is one of the teams in one of the kitchens in Nassau. Um, again, we, we, we reach Friday, Saturday, 1.5 uh, million meals. We did more than 40 medical evacuations. We got six helicopters, two seaplanes, one boat with two helipads. And we are an organization that if you take a look at the official organizations in Bahamas, we still don't show up anywhere. But we are right there 12 days before UN, 12 days before USAID. By the time they came, we already reached over half a million meals served. I personally opened more than six landing helipads in baseball, <laughs> baseball courts, baseball fields, tennis courts, basketball courts. Um, I cannot believe that I will become such a sportsman all of a sudden. <laughs> um, we had this amazing Navy captain who was the leading uh, helicopter uh, pilot. We had more helicopters for a simple reason. I was asking, it's not a way to feed people, so it was not cheap. But at the same time, it's more expensive to leave, leave people hungry. We couldn't do it by boat because the boat is too far from Nassau. 
We couldn't do a kitchen initially because the entire Mash Harbor was totally destroyed. But for you to understand the creativity of what we do, because that's what we do. Um, many people were not moving in because there was no gas stations, was no fuel, was not yet fuel, was nothing. But by then, when everybody was saying that we have to wait until fuel arrives, we already had eight, 12 cars functioning every single day. You know what my guys were doing to make sure the cars got gas? They would go to the boats in the middle of the road, they will put a tube, they will siphon out, they will do a circle to know this is a gas station, and they will fill, they'll, they'll fill up every single car every single day. One boat at a time, we had one gas station at a time. When others were waiting for gas, my teams were already delivering food to every single corner of the islands. That's what we are. So that's what Central Kitchen, and that's what we did in, in this, especially the last two years. And my promise to all of you is that I hope we never have to add the Central Kitchen here. But we are trying to become this organization that in a very simple, clean, fast, quick way, using the local community, will come and would support the community to start one plate at a time, giving them hope of a better tomorrow. My teams are right now, the teams are right now in California. They responded to the tornadoes in Dallas. They're right now in Guatemala. They're right now in Venezuela. Um, and that's what we do, just bring in the hope that one plate at a time, we can all dream of a better tomorrow. Thank you very much. Too long, yeah? On behalf of the student council, student body, faculty, and staff at the universities at Shady Grove, we would like to thank Chef Jose Andre and Jackie DeCarlo for having a vision and executing it so successfully. Thank you for touching lives and making a positive impact on the community. My name is Malvina Frimpo, and I'm majoring in public health at the University of Maryland. I am also the student council vice president. At the universities at Shady Grove, we focus on the academic excellence of our students as well as their safety and total well-being. USG is a campus that brings a larger community together. It cannot, we cannot deny the fact that a growing and productive community only exists as a result of healthy people. Here at USG, we aim to increase well-being by providing students with food, toiletries, and baby items through the Grover's Essential on-site pantry and veggies and fruits through the mobile market. I am very passionate about finding innovative ways to improve the quality of health and well-being of all. I have always believed that everyone deserves the opportunity and tools to be healthy and to be able to live their best lives. I've also always believed that a leader doesn't have to be someone with a title. A leader can be anyone willing and ready to take action when the need arises. This event is particularly important to me because I get to learn from passionate people with visions who are changing the world and the overall health of people by providing them with nutritious food. As student council members, it is our goal to listen and to represent the students that have elected us. For students to be engaged and successful, they need, to, they need to have their basic needs met. It is only then that they can function as healthy individuals and advocate for more. This event is important to us because it allows us to learn from leaders who have always taken initiatives even when it was not their responsibility to do so. We strive to be great leaders like them. Now, I would like to open the floor for a few questions from our audience. Ebony Gatson and Jennifer Orantes from the Student Council will be coming around with the microphones. Hi there, I'm Heather Bruskin and I'm the Executive Director of the Montgomery County Food Council and thank all of you for your leadership locally and around the world uh, in meeting the needs of residents uh, related to food. Um, I'm 
proud of the work that we've all done together in Montgomery County to build the overall strength of our food system, but I think we have a lot of progress to make in terms of building our resilience in the face of disaster or in unexpected disruptions in our food distribution networks. And I'm curious if there are best practices or examples that you've seen in other places, Chef, that you would recommend we bring here in our local community to um, be prepared uh, in the event that it needs to happen. Yeah. I, thank you very much. Um, we've been uh, very res uh, responsive to use when chaos happens, we show up and try to organize chaos. But we've been working more towards in the places we've already been, like North Carolina, Puerto Rico, of, of creating our, our own network of response. But not so much with local um, institutions or local governments, but more on our own, because sometimes it becomes very hard to. But let me give you examples. So when we have many EOCs, the emergency centers of every community when something happens, right? And usually, in the case, for example, in Florida, Panama City, Mexico, Mexico Beach was totally destroyed, especially the first two rows of homes by the beach. We're talking thousands of people lost their homes. Panama Beach was in a very complicated location where the traffic patterns makes everything impossible, uh, meaning driving for 10 miles will, will be five hours in the middle of the chaos. And, and we were, um, we, we don't, didn't have any hotel nearby, so we will stay at the EOC itself, which is very rare, because again, we are not an official organization, but because they see what we do. EOCs, for example, when sometimes if something major happens, they're gonna have hundreds of people part of the response, they barely have a kitchen to feed the EOC itself. The school systems, some of the school systems in America, they have amazing kitchens, many of them. In North Carolina, in Wilmington, we rented a kitchen that was in a catering company and works fine for us but we were feeding the biggest shelter in Wilmington, which is inside that school, and they had two, 3,000 people. The school had the most perfect kitchen to feed those people. But there is not a law in place that when emergency happens, those kitchens will be used for serving the community as the main hub in the shelter or for me, school systems are great because under one leadership, you can be activating two, three, four, five kitchens in three, four, five, ten strategic schools located around the communities that they've been damaged, and all of a sudden those schools become what they already are, a center, a center, a central part of the community. So it's many ideas like this that we need to be putting in place that I hope World Central Kitchen will help put in place. But because sometimes it's hard used to do nationwide, what we will do? Well, we've been doing tests. When the federal government shut down, we didn't open one kitchen in DC. What we did was bigger than that. We were able to bring together 575 restaurants in, 70, in 35 states, providing hundreds of thousands of meals to federal employees each day. You see, that was another type of emergency. It was a political emergency, but we were able to activate that, right? So what I can tell you is that I don't see a lot of plans. You will, I know it's certain, a lot of officials will disagree with me and say he's not saying the truth and he's lying. Like it's not about lie or not. That you have a plan, but then you don't know how to put it up and running equals that you don't have a plan. Um, plans that they are in folders, this big that then nobody reads, that doesn't equal a plan. We don't have that folder. But I can tell you we have a better plan than many of the people that they say they have one. So what we're trying is use not to fight it, but to try to say we need bigger, the bigger problems, they have very simple solutions. When you have an emergency, food and water is just one of the problems. 
You need to take care of many other things. Uh, rebuilding the roads, fixing the roads, the electric grid, uh, rescue for people that are missing, or um, medicines, or hospitals, making sure that, I mean, it's so many areas. But if you start breaking those areas in small ones, and you put experts in each area, and with enough collaboration between them that you can help each other, things shouldn't be so difficult. When Katrina happens is one of the moments I thought we needed something like was Sandra Kitchen. And I wish I was in New Orleans, and I was not. When we put 10,000 more Americans in the Superdome, and I don't know if you remember, but it's a book, it's books written about that. They had no food and water. Think women were being raped inside what technically was an official shelter. You know what the Superdome, a sports stadium is? Everybody thinks it's a place that you go to watch your sports team or your, or your favorite singer. But the, actually, a big sports complex, a big arena, is a gigantic restaurant that entertains with the sports. <laughs> it, it, go to the Nationals. It's only food venues. And happens you have players playing in the middle. <laughs> so imagine when an arena can become that. In Puerto Rico, we had different uh, fast food companies inside one of the arenas. We rented the arena kitchen, number one. Why do you have to rent when you're, but that's another story. And we were doing 75,000 meals a day from that kitchen. I went to do more. And how? I went to activate the food vendors around the arena. Domino's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, because the owners of those venues said, you can use them. Somebody in the government in Puerto Rico told me, we cannot do that, and we are not allowed to do that. That's what we need to be changing, to make sure that buildings and facilities that becomes, that belongs to us, the people, are quick and fast put at the service of providing relief to the people. And with things like that, you are always ready. But we need to do better work in making sure that we have those plans. I would like to thank uh, all the uh, speakers this afternoon. Very inspirational to listen to their stories and how passionate they are about uh, food. Um, chef, was that a curveball you threw out last night <laughs> I, at the game? I wasn't sure. The what, what? Was it a curveball that you threw out the first pitch? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I tried, but I was hidden by, by yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was a double fastball. Double fastball. That means it looks fast, but then it stops. Uh, I've been practicing that. Uh, I didn't fully show it yet, uh, because I want to join a league. Um, <laughs> and I want that to be my secret. Uh, uh, actually, a quick thing. Um, what is your favorite restaurant in San Sebastian, number one? And number two, I'd like to wish my sweetheart happy anniversary and a birthday. Hey, happy anniversary. <laughs> Um, um, San Sebastian uh, is so many places, but I will not tell you go to one. Just go uh, bar to bar <laughs> until your mental GPS doesn't work anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I will go to Pincho Bar to Pincho Bar. That's a great way to help the community. If you go to one place and you sit there, you miss so much. Just walk and go from one place to the other, eat one pincho, one glass of wine, then another one, then a pincho, another glass of wine. When you feel you are not able to hit the glass with your lips, <laughs> at that moment I will tell you go back to your hotel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, or you can pst, spit out, that works, and you can be all night. But that's what I will do, go pincho bar to pincho bar. And you're going to be that way, meeting people, learning about the city, losing weight, helping the local economy. Um, I mean, you're going to do so many things if you go place to place, I'm telling you. We take one more question. Hi. Hi, my name is Erin. Um, I'm a student in the nursing program right now at, at uh, for University of Maryland. And um, I have a background in nutrition. I actually studied undergrad um, at College Park, nutrition. So I'm, I'm really passionate about this. So I think this is great. 
Um, but I was curious, when beginning uh, World Central Kitchen, what type of professional backgrounds did you find extremely valuable when, one, you began WCK, and then, two, in moments of like challenge or adversity? Like, what kind of professional backgrounds really spoke out? More than the professional backgrounds were people that were, you know, the, the worst is when somebody comes to me and tells me, Jose, you don't know what you're doing, right? Because in part, they were right. Like, you, you're totally right. I have no clue what I'm doing. But I only know one thing. These people are hungry, and we're trying to feed them. What else is there to know, right? right. You don't need to have, forget an MBA. You don't need to have what I have, that I left school when I was 14, 15. Um, so the backgrounds are backgrounds that they're creating. Yes. Hold on. You cannot have everybody that they create. You know, and then they turn you crazy. <laughs> then you need all the backgrounds that they're systematic. And, but there's still a certain level of creativity, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not so much the background of what did you study, but more who you as the person are. And what we want is backgrounds that understand that we are going to be learning from each other, that we are not very pyramidal. We are more a flat organization, that nobody is really the boss. You know who the boss is, but he doesn't impose himself by or herself by the position, but because it's the best idea that everybody agrees. Uh, still, you will have sometimes need the strong leaders that the vast majority think this is the best idea, and somebody very strongly is going to say, it's no way, but you need to convince them. Because you need the team convinced that also that's the best idea. Right. So the background is not so much the profession, but as people that are willing to, to adapt mm -hmm. to the chaos of the moment, doesn't allow anything but to adapt. Because anything we decided yesterday may be changing tomorrow. Um, and that's uh, um, and that's very much what it is. It's embracing embracing chaos. Um, uh, if you embrace chaos, then you are in a good moment. So for us, that's the best asset. Uh, who came with me, Puerto Rico, for example, that became our obviously most notorious operation, and many of the stories are in this book. We fed an island. That I'm okay recommending it because 100% of the proceeds go to World Central Kitchen. So. I, I, I'm not ashamed to telling everybody you should buy it. Um, but this was Nate Mook. Nate came, he was a, a, a film director. He has an NGO, he had an NGO called What Took You So Long? He will go to Somalia and do a video for the government of the new elected president to tell Somalis why democracy will be better for them than not. That type of guy. He didn't have background in food. Or, he became the director. Now he's the executive director of World Central Kitchen, right? Wow. So we are not all cooks, even we base it on cooks. It's people from all the very diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But number one thing makes us all equal is that we are people that we adapt to the unforeseen circumstances. We say we don't plan, we don't meet. We use feet. Uh, sometimes, you know what makes us very weak in these situations? when there is too many plants. Because when the plant breaks away because what happened didn't go as you planned for, everybody freezes. Right. So too much planning can be the enemy of a good response. So for us, that's what we look for, people that are highly adaptable to any circumstance. Thank you again, Jackie and Chef Andre, for sharing so much of your insights and experience. Now, I would like to welcome a USG Executive Director, Dr. Sue Edelstein, who will share the final highlights of our event today. First, let me thank all the panel members 
for their passion and for their leadership. I also want to especially thank the chef for spending time with us today. I want to especially thank you for your humanity. I want to thank you for your example that a single individual can galvanize a community. And I want to thank you for your message, which is everyone can make a difference and everyone should. In my view, you are a, a national treasure. And I thank you. <laughs> we have one more thing that we'd like to do. I want to invite our county executive, Mark Elwich, and our county council president, Nancy Navarro, to come up. And they want to make a presentation to you. I think that Barry will be mine. I will. Um, I don't know how anybody doesn't feel humbled by this, and uh, I'm just blown away at the work he's done and the way he's been able to do this work and engage so many other people in this enterprise and uh, to basically defy institutional wisdom and everything else to just go out and do what needed to be done. Um, that's really quite remarkable. Um, I really do. Um, I appreciate it. You're a beacon. Uh, I've been doing Diwali celebrations the last this last week, and Diwali is you know, a celebration of the triumph of good over evil. It's a celebration of light and happiness. It's the new year, and I just think you're just so symbolic of a representational of what people have been talking about all week long about the triumph of light over darkness. And I just, um, I couldn't help but think about this in light of what I've been doing the last couple of days. So I'm very grateful that you're here and sharing this with everybody and uh, hope that we can all, in our own ways, follow the kind of example that you've set. So, Nancy, do you want to say something? Well, Chef Jose Andres, uh, it is so, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I, so many things to say, but I will only highlight a few uh, things that stand out for me. As an immigrant uh, born in Caracas, Venezuela, as the wife of a Haitian American, uh, as the first Latina to serve on the county council, as the only woman. I say this because at a time when I know so many in our community feel like they are targeted just for being immigrants, it is always such an inspiration when I see you do the extraordinary things that you do. And for the young people who are here, all the students who are, who are here, he is an embodiment of what you can become, that you don't have to be unidimensional, just do one thing, that you can amplify your reach. If you have a thought and a vision, if you're inspired, he is the embodiment of how you can go and do that. So from the bottom of my heart, I just wanna thank you, and I feel so honored that you're a Montgomery County resident, of course, uh, and, uh, and I do contribute to World Central Kitchen, so everybody should do too. <laughs> anyway, gracias, muchísimas gracias por ser un ejemplo tan impresionante para nosotros aquí en este condado. So we will start and read the proclamation. It's short. <laughs> That's short? It's actually really small print. It could have been, it would have been longer if we had used a bigger print. Uh, um, whereas <laughs> Chef Jose Andres is an internationally recognized culinary innovator, best-selling author, educator, television personality, humanitarian, and chef owner of Think Food Group and founder of World Central Kitchen and... Whereas he was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in both 2012 and 2018 and has been honored with the Outstanding Chef and Humanitarian of the Year Awards by the James Beer Foundation and is a pioneer of Spanish tapas in the United States. And whereas Chef Andres' nonprofit organization, 
World Central Kitchen provides smart solutions to end hunger and poverty by using the power of food to strengthen communities. Evidence of the extraordinary work his team has done in the 3.6 million plus meals served to the people of Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria and more recent effort to serve more than 1 million meals to those impacted in the Bahamas by Hurricane Dorian and. Whereas Chef Andres continually finds time to give back and to inspire the next generation of leaders as demonstrated by his October 28th, 2019 presentation to students and community members at the universities of Shady Grove. Through a program in conjunction with USG and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore Hospitality and Tourism Management Program, now therefore do we, Mark Elrich as County Executive and Nancy Navarro as County Council President, hereby proclaim October 28, 2019, as Chef Jose Andres Day in Montgomery County, Maryland, in recognition of his outstanding contribution to our global community.